Welcome to Lock and Key Unlocked, a podcast about Lock and Key, both the graphic novel series by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez, and also the upcoming Netflix show, I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. Woohoo! And we have a very special guest here today. We're very excited to chat with him. Ladies and gentlemen, the artist of Lock and Key, Gabriel Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah Roddy. It's so good to talk to you again. It's so good to see you again. Uh, it's been so long. Yeah. And we are ramping up here to the Netflix series, which is dropping really soon. Um, I think, you know, we've been recapping each volume of yes. the book. At yes. the current time, I don't I don't know exactly where this is going to tape, uh, but we're getting ready to tape Clockworks. Yeah. Of course, we're familiar with the whole graphic novel series. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I already listened I to, to the first episodes until Crown of Shadow, which is on Spotify already. So uh, I, I'm almost oh, nice. uh, up to date with all wow. that. Yeah. All right. You're well, we won't do any. We won't do any spoilers beyond that for you. Yeah. We don't want to. <laughs> no, spoil no spoilers that. for Clockworks. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, they, you're they you're not going to believe what happens to these characters. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's. let's sh- if only guys oh, you, uh, should know how weird it is to be talking with actual characters from a comic book that I drew. It's very, very. <laughs> <insane>. <laughs> uh, I think it's when people ask me how it is to to see Lock and Key coming to life. In the TV series, man, I, I've seen this from years from now uh, with you guys, oh so it, it's, it mm-hmm. couldn't be more disturbing than this. <laughs> <laughs> People say that about us a lot. That is so nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for those of you, I mean, I feel like everybody knows this because we talk about it constantly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Over the course of the series, um, we were lucky enough to be drawn into this comic. First, yeah. Dr. Zalbin, yeah. and then yes. Pete the Geek. And yeah. then Justin, the prom star who lived. Exactly. Uh, no, no every, everyone lived. Everyone lived. You'll see. Wait, wow. I don't know about yeah. Pete. Pete lived? Pete he lived, was cut in course. half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you have to see the, the, new, uh, the new reach that the power of the Mending Key is going to have in the future, I'm pretty sure. So you figure <laughs> out, once you're not All turned right. into ashes, you can see w- what magic the Mending Key can make. Well, but yeah, well, I'm not well, it's to great to find out a for, truth for about your canon uh, fans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's great. I'm looking forward to pulling Pete eventually out of that mending cabinet. I think that's going to be real good. Well, I guess yeah, it's I'll going to be there. a scene with Doctor Salvin being the uh-huh. corner of the dead body of Pete when he comes back to life and eats Doctor <laughs> Salvin, something like that. I'm not exactly sure. Yes. And I think then uh, Justin, the the prom king, tries to save the doctor, but I'm not sure if he's going to make it. So I'm I'm going yeah, to leave you with that big hanger, guys. <laughs> It's going to be amazing. Oh, man. People's You're so many spoilers for, for the, the upcoming yeah. Lock and Key comics. Uh, you're really giving it all away. The yeah, characters is, that people care about. This is the about. non-spoiler part. This is the, like, the <laughs> easy part. This is going to be in the trailer. So no spoilers. <laughs> Just in advance. All right. Well, why don't we – let's take a big step backwards and talk about this. We have been talking about the comic book, but mm-hmm. uh, the other thing that we've been doing along with the podcast as we've been gearing up the Netflix show is talking through the long – Long history of getting Lock and Key to screen, which I think started the same month the first issue came out and has stretched over the past 12 years. You're finally seeing it. You've been, as far as I know, on three different sets at this point for Pilots of Lock and Key. Exactly. What is it like finally seeing it come to life as the full series? You mean allegedly seeing coming to life? Because before wow. February 7th, I, I'm afraid it still can be canceled. So I'm not yeah. sure if it's going to be on the air. So far, allegedly, it will be. I'm very optimistic. I'm very happy that it probably going to happen. But I'm not going to give anything for granted until it actually airs. So you have the healthiest relationship toward Hollywood that I've ever heard. That is right. healthy. Well, that's I, weird. February 6th, Netflix shut down. Yeah, oh, so strange. No, come on, man. Any, anything can happen, you know. Because of a leak that uh, the comic book creator did in a podcast, the show is going to be canceled. You know how this is. Wow. Oh, so man. it's all going to be the fault of the lone gunman. Yeah. Yeah. All fingers oh, are going us. to point at you. The... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man, we're the lone gunman of Lock and Key. That's yeah. very exciting, guys. Exactly. Uh, uh, well, three you good-looking have... gunmen. <laughs> So you have been on these three sets, though. You followed it as it's been through potential movie opportunities, movie yes. trilogies. It was an option yes. by various companies. Um, what has that journey been like for you, though? It has been 
incredibly like weird, exciting on one side. Uh, it caught us to so many different parts of the developing of the comic itself in, in a way that made us company throughout the entire journey. Because I think the very first time that I get into the US for a Comic-Con was the year in which we were releasing a small slipcase with the first six issues of Lock and Key that were like the announcement for the first trade that was going to be collected later. And I think that was the first time that I met you guys, that you yeah, guys mm -hmm. interviewed us in in the IDW booth, I think, something like yeah. that. It also was the first time that I ever saw Joe Hill in person. And it right. was also uh, the first time that I was with the people of IDW in person for a Comic-Con. And I was informed that the series was optioned by Dimension Films, I think, for the first time yeah. uh, in, in that show. So it was like all the threads related to Lock and Key that came together in person for the first time in that show. Wow. And you guys were involved in that. So yeah. being, about to, <laughs> being about to release the streaming uh, show uh, for good, I hope. And being talking with you guys again about that is incredibly weird. It's like coming full <laughs> circle with this entire process. Yeah. But as I was saying, it's been uh, very strange because uh, it was very uh, – as soon as the first issue came out, people got interested in the property. And when we were releasing uh, Welcome to Lovecraft, I think – Already, the idea of making a, a movie was dropped because uh, it was there was an interest for making a TV show for Fox that was under production by uh, Steven Spielberg and Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi, who were the guys that later on came to develop the first pilot, the one directed by Mark Romanek and written by Josh Friedman. And that was... Uh, the first visit that we did with Joe, we we went to Pittsburgh to see the shooting of the of the pilot uh, episode, in which uh, Josh did a very like uh, it, it solved a very tough problem because he wanted to have the entire first volume, uh, uh, Welcome to Lovecraft, the entire plot into the first uh, episode of that proposal for the TV show, wow. and he came up wow. with a really really good script, uh, and and w we were incredibly lucky that. Throughout the entire process of trying to get uh, Lock and Key to the screen, we have these amazing teams in charge of them. Because if you think in the first one, we got Josh Friedman writing and Mark Romanek directing. We had as our director uh, Dan Bishop from Mad Men and Carnival. And then we got into the second attempt when uh, the Muschetis, and the Muschetis and Barbara tried to make uh, the second pilot, this time for Hulu, a couple of years ago in which uh, Andy was directing and the script was uh, written by, by Joe, m mostly. And then uh, the art direction was Dave Blass, the guy that did the art direction for Preacher and The Boys. Uh, yeah, and nice. now we're having this uh, uh, last attempt with no other showrunner than Carlton Cuse, which is like a yeah. legend in the medium, yeah. the guy behind this small TV show called Lost that I think a few people worldwide saw at some point. I've been know. wanting to check that out. I've heard a lot yeah, about it. I've, I've heard about <laughs> that, yeah. Um, and then uh, co uh, uh, running the show with him is Meredith Averill, who did uh, The Haunting of Hill House, which I loved. So I can't yeah. imagine the property to be in better hands right now to be in, both of them in charge. Carlton was involved already in the in the previous attempt to to, to uh, let the TV show come to life in Hulu, and he was the one that saved the project was in crash in Hulu and offered it to to Netflix with the people of IDW Entertainment. It was the the potential that they saw in the in the Hulu project that the one that excited uh, Netflix to order an entire season up front. It's so, so exciting yeah. to the fact that lock and key has had three shots is, and then one that went is unbelievable. Like I can't yeah, think of another yeah. uh, I think story it's probably or the property only case in which you have a, a property or license that you have three attempts to yeah. make it go to life. They were all like very ambitious, uh, ambitious attempts of adapting. They were very expensive pilots. The, the amount of, talent and time and resources spent in each one of them is like insane so that they 
the fact that they keep pushing for it uh, speaks in a while of the tremendous love that everyone involved in any attempt of adapting lock and key. Uh, the love they had for the source material, the love they have for the characters, the thematic and the mythology of the series, and also the potential that it has to develop like new storylines throughout the universe that's presented in the in the comics. So, for us as creators of the of the original story, it's a uh, a tremendous like honor and, ex and a unique experience to see this amount of talented people trying to pull off something new out of the thing that we crafted and to see all that talent and effort invested in this and finally getting to see the the final result in this one has been like mind bending we're tremendously like happy and uh, and very excited for it because i i think uh, in, in all the three attempts, and especially in this last one in, in Netflix, uh, what we saw the most is the, is the love and care that the people in charge of this have for these characters and this story. And, and for us as creators, that's the only thing that bothered us. It was a, such a meaningful story for us and such a meaningful and important story for our readers that to see that in the right hands at the right time, is, it's really uh, something to appreciate and to be thankful of. Now, uh, since you, it's such a visual book and such an amazing book, and uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> I, I like, for me, seeing the house from the preview, <laughs> from the, the teasers that there, I was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's ripped right from the pages. <laughs> As someone who helped create that, were, were there certain things where you were like, oh man, I hope they get the house right? What are the keys going to look like? Anything like that? Well, uh, I'm very like open-minded regarding the adaptations of a <laughs> comic book work into other media. I'm very aware that when you adapt a story, when you adapt a form of storytelling, when you, especially when you translate it from one media to a different one, you have to make changes. Uh, comics and, and visual media, despite having uh, similar points, they have a lot of differences as well and and especially for us in which we made the storytelling part of how we develop the story we immediately understood that if you take the story and move it to another medium you have to make lots of change so in regard of that i'm i'm pretty like uh not prejudicial about that uh, and in, in fact for me it's like exciting to to figure out what yeah. are the things that they changed what are the things they kept and uh, anyway as you say when when we went to visit the sets in which they were shooting the show and and when we saw how they sold like the inner architecture of the house and stuff like that it was very impressive to realize that they took a lot of stuff from the book and they gave it a new twist to make it work in in this new media and so for me it's like that's incredibly exciting and inspiring to see a, a group of very talented craftsmen develop this entire new thing based on something that you dreamed once and put into a drawing and see it coming <laughs> to life in a, in a different scale and in a different way. It also, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, back and forth experience because in a way, having that experience helped me a lot to realize how eager I was to return to this universe. And this is something that we've been discussing with Joe. We've been like uh, tainting ideas from a while back, a few years back to, to return to this universe and to return to Key House, to return to these characters and to figure out which new stories we want to say. But also I, I now, with the experience I had with the first run of comics and then seeing these transformations that he had in the attempt of adaptation, it gave me a lot of new ideas of how to exploit visually mm -hmm. what we were going to do in the future. So that's a, a, for me has been an inspirational experience. And I'm very like happy that the people that is in charge of this is like, taking very thoughtful decisions in the time that every time that they change something from the book is because of them, something is because of something they want to achieve from the perspective of the development of the story or from the perspective of the storytelling of the story. And that's uh, incredibly like uh, interesting for me as a, a fellow storyteller to, to realize how they do that. Yeah, there was a, well, a, a this featurette came out uh, yeah. recently. The yeah. all about the head key, 
yeah. and how it was a change because obviously it's very difficult for them to animate um, a head popping open, yeah. uh, <laughs> like yeah. the top of a pot. Um, yeah. And instead, it's like a sort of a doorway that you walk into, and then you're fully yeah. immersed in the world yeah. of each character's head. And yeah. I thought that was such a smart way to let us get to be in that world more. It was such exactly. a exactly. When we were uh, talking about um, the the comic series, it was such a memorable and immersive moment in the comic yeah. when you get yeah. to see yeah. the inside of each character's the head. Double page spread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah in a way, and the fact I think... that we get to go all the way in for more, like for minutes, is exactly. super exciting. No, it's it's great to to see that they figure out a way to recreate the same experience of the story, but in an entire different way, and also because. One of the, the things, the magical things that comics storytelling has is as you put everything in drawings uh, with the same language all the time, you can do something as bizarre as a kid with the head open and look inside it and it all seems to blend in the same reality very naturally. In the page, everything looks like naturally integrated. To achieve that same effect with a practical effect of the with where CGI is extremely difficult. In fact, for me, one of the, the reasons that I I get to dislike more and more people with heavy use of CGI is because uh, a CGI, for example, allows you to put the camera wherever you want to put it. It's sometimes uh, you get like the effect of being on a roller coaster instead of being inside a, a narrative in a movie. So many times when you mm-hmm. get these complex CGI fight scenes in which the camera spins and turns around, it makes such an impossible f- point of view for an actual person to be like involved in that world that that kind of resource like takes me out of the story. In a way, I think that the people are trying to in the show to use as many practical effects as they could in order to make a vivid experience out of it and make it all as a, a reality that's integrated in the narrative and in the experience of the actors portraying the scenes. So I guess it's a, it's very smart. And as it was shown in the feature it itself, it allows you to recreate this experience of interacting with your own thoughts in a way that doesn't seem like weird or too surreal for the viewer and i think that's a way to 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 ground the same concept and present it in a way that works in this new media but on the opposite end of the spectrum i mean getting away from changes there's also things like the head key mm-hmm. looks absolutely perfect or yeah. bodhi looking in the well and saying yeah. are you my echo is paced yeah. out perfectly there must be a certain thrill in seeing something like that perfectly reproduced yeah. for the comic uh, absolutely. In the same way. Uh, myself like being an architect to see the well house built almost exactly as i design it it's like insanely weird <laughs> a little yeah, unsettling like, where you're like yeah, wait this yeah, is my it, this is in my brain are yeah, you in my uh, head key uh, space no, the, the weirdest thing is is to get into it and, and realize oh my god it, this actually works as i designed it it's not that i just made it work in the drawings like twisting proportions stuff like that no this actually works as a architectural project and the same thing with the keys <laughs> and in fact when i when i started drawing the keys when i start with the with the ghost key which is was the first one that, that i designed because it's the one that was going to be on the cover of the first issue. Uh, the first decision that I took was to make the drawings as if they were an actual industrial design project. So I got a, a, a small notebook with millimetric grid to design mm. the keys in a scale like was like five or ten to one in the same way that, that you design like small pieces for mechanics in industrial design. So my idea was to, okay, so this is going to be a key. I, I want to imagine this as if actually a craftsman eventually would have to actually build these things. So then when I, when we started doing the comic and uh, Israel Skelton from Skelton Crew came out and started dro- yeah. doing the props of the key and, and doing it exactly as they were designed in the comics, and then you get to see that the production design of the TV show does them almost exactly as they were designed in, in the comic. It's like insane because then you realize it's really fun that this idea that I have over 10 years ago of making making believe that this was going to be done someday by someone, it actually happened. And that's really surreal. But I think it's so interesting that you say that you designed it as if it was real. 
And yes. then I think that helped to make it real to us, the readers. And then eventually yes. Yes. to this everyone is... who was like, let's make this real as a TV show or movie because the, the meticulous attention to detail was there. And yeah, I, that's, because that's a I, huge. I remember when I read the first script from Joe, when they sent me after they sent me the pitch and the description of the characters to start working in the science and stuff. When I read the first script and, and I think I got the second when I was started drawing the first issue of Lock and Key. I immediately realized that despite being a story with a lot of, of like uh, insane magical experience and stuff like that, the core of the story was going to be grounded in a very human and vivid and appealing drama of a, va- of a family trying to rebuild itself. So in a way, I, I thought that as much as I could, the entire world around these characters has to be like very believable and very and had to be f- had to felt very real from the storytelling perspective. So the fact that the locks were this locksmith uh, uh, family, a family of locksmiths that were making this key throughout the ages, you had to imagine those keys as actual props that could be made by a guy working in a in a in a furniture and trying to get the metal and molding it, and had to have like pieces that could be carved and stuff like that. So trying to think of all that stuff as something that could actually happen in reality would help ground the grounded parts of the story and make the tension and the contrast contrast with the magic events in the story pop out like with more strength so it was an a constant like uh dialogue between the more grounded aspects of the story and the magical of the story in which basically the magic is the resource that we use to deal with all the metaphors throughout the the development of the plot and the development of the characters and that's uh, something that we try to make uh, to feel like very natural naturally integrated in the believability of the stuff that you could actually experience as something that could be part of the real life of any person uh, it's. Uh, I want to ask about uh, something that you mentioned in an interview. We talked a little bit about on the podcast, just sort of on the same track here. Oh, before where... before that, I want to mention that oh, it's yeah. very interesting that we're going to have the longest online interview with me ever. So Pete could check this as the basically the backstory <laughs> bible of all the interviews <laughs> that you can uh, uh, talk about in the yeah. development of the podcast podcast up front so this is this is all for you pete that's it oh, yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you so weird. much next episode next recap episode of the podcast pete's gonna open up and say so i was listening to this interview with <laughs> yeah. you yeah. i am gonna do that this guy pete had a great question he asked about <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, but I, I believe you said this, and I, I wanted to get your thoughts on it. I think it was something about halfway through the run of the series where you said you were aiming to age up the characters as yes. you went, that you started yeah. with a more childlike look for them at the beginning, just in yeah. terms of the actual design of the characters, and then yeah. age them up as they go. That's very apparent as I was reading it, but I, I'm curious to get your take on it and how that worked out for you in the span of the series versus, say, halfway through. Well, it was sort of a, a bet I did at the beginning because I, when I started working on a lock and key, uh, I felt like I had like all the storytelling tools I needed to tell the story properly, but I still felt like my drawing skills were not like good enough to do. Oh, a come realist- on! How dare you! <laughs> Well, no, drawing how skills dare you insult our friend Gabriel? <laughs> hang with me, hang with me. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, especially because this comic, I knew it was going to demand like a very, very subtle work in the expression and the ability of the characters to to convey like very specific emotions without dialogues a lot of the time. So they have to rely a lot in the expression of the eyes and the body language and all that stuff. So I took the decision at the beginning to make this style like a bit more cartoony in a way to express also like the state of mind and maturity that the characters had at the beginning of the story because I knew immediately that this was going to be like a coming of age story, especially for Tyler and Kizzy. So I decided that as long as the issues keep developing over and over, I was going to slowly 
twist the 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 style in a way that approached me to a more realistic uh, appeal and and way to portray the shapes of the characters because I knew that throughout drawing them over and over and over I will be able to convey oh, that what my, was my bet at least to convey the same like <laughs> nuance and subtlety in the expressions and the communication of the characters with uh, less expressionist drawings and it's something that I was like specially aware of when I was at the halfway through the the story when we were in crown of shadows you you can if you compare the books you can see already a slight difference between the, the the design of the characters compared to the first one and it's much more dramatic in in the in the latter ones i, I think if, if you take uh, alpha and omega and put it sideways to welcome to lovecraft then you can realize how this change uh, came to be throughout the story and I think it's it's very beautiful that we had the chance to end the story with a scene with Tyler alone with his father, because oh. in Tyler himself you you see the the process of growing and yeah and quit being a child finally to embrace his early adulthood and close the story in this part of his life. So yeah, it was sort of a bet based on the limitations that I felt I had at the very beginning of the story. Uh, I remember uh, reading an interview of Mike Mignola in which they asked him about his work on Hellboy, and he told that every comic author that's aware of uh, his limit should realize that the only way to get into doing something actually good with your skills is after 10 years of work. And when I was starting with Lock and Key, despite the fact that I had drawn over a thousand pages because of, before of that, I was still in my eight and a half year drawing comics. So <laughs> I guess I had to have a year and a half or so before uh, having like <laughs> full uh, control of, of more skills yeah. to tell it. Got to kick off those training wheels. Yeah, uh, yeah, like exactly. Yeah. Now, it's, it's funny because you're talking about uh, like the halfway uh, point and like changing it. When we were rereading it uh yeah. for for the podcast and for the show it was uh, we talked a lot about the facial expressions and things that we didn't notice kind of the first time around and how yeah. rereading it, it, it it's so much more powerful and you talked about in this one interview that you've done that I like to quote a <laughs> yeah, lot <that's> yeah. exactly <laughs> you, <laughs> good you talked about <laughs> how that scene uh the play scene like double page spread yeah. was one of your favorites yeah. and that kind of rereading it like that is so much more powerful seeing that again and yeah. how much information really is in that just kind of portrait of a stage. Uh, there's yeah. so much storytelling going on. And you had said that that was kind of one of your favorite moments. Yeah. Um, we have our favorite moments, but yeah. <laughs> of the things artistically that you did in this book, and there's so many emotional and beautiful things like the Calvin and Hobbes stuff and yeah. all the different uh, uh, stylistic choices that you that you did. What was something that either was your favorite or you were proud that you feel like you really pulled off? Um, that's a very hard question. It's like picking up between your kids, which is your favorite one. But, yeah, which is uh, your favorite kid? I, I'm just I my daughter. favorite child, my daughter. Yeah, <laughs> my favorite kid. Uh, none of them is my wife. She's the one that helped me endure the kids. Yeah. But no, they Smart. are all amazing. Uh, now the thing with locking kids, uh, I'm very like happy with the uh, with the way in which we were able to develop the entire story. So it's very hard to pick moments. But if I, if I have to pick some, I had to say that the, the play scene, it's one of my favorite because one of the fun things about that double pitch spread is that both Joe Hill and I were very aware that we, we were going to plant a lot of seeds in that scene. So we knew that a lot of things that are, were going to be hinted in that book were not going to be answered until volume four or five eventually. So it was very fun to have the chance to dive into that and to start like figuring out ideas for the future of the story just by the development of that particular scene. Um, another one that's, uh, that's very important for me and in a way I think sums up the the commitment that we have with this story was the 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 closing of of Crown of Shadows, the story of Nina Locke, because oh, yeah. it was it was a horrible experience to do that that issue. It was very 
very emotionally draining and exhausting. Uh, it's it's weird when you when you thought back and and you you have the experience of reading the single issue because it's an issue that you can read in about ten minutes. But when you're drawing it, you have to <laughs> to live with this <laughs> poor woman falling apart for an entire month, <laughs> 12 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week. And it was like, I remember when I read the script of that issue was like, this is going to be horrible, horrible. Oh, and it was <laughs> devastating. And, it, and it's, and, but then you feel like the responsibility that you have to portray this emotion in a very like a uh, proper way, because somewhat you're reflecting a sort of drama that, a lot of people suffer in a way. I, I one of the most like meaningful experience I had working in Lock and Key was an email that I got from a, a reader of the book, a, a woman that wrote me just a few lines just to tell me that she was so grateful of having the chance of reading this story because the way in which she saw the grieving of Nina Lock evolving the story helped her cope with the death of her husband that died oh, wow. on the 9-11 attacks because he was one of the rescue team uh, oh, guys that oh, died. Wow. And then you realize that when you make stories, you make connections that you never expect that would happen, but just for them to happen and then to, to be a way to help someone living so far away that never actually met you, uh, it implicates a, a huge responsibility. So uh, I think in a way that story of Nina Locke reflects a lot of that. And the other absolute favorite moment of the entire series for me, I, for different reasons are, are two. One is the Calvin and Hobbes uh, tribute that we did in Sparrow. So the good, way in yeah. which we had the chance to play with the comic book form uh, in a way that was part of the story as well was incredibly fun to do it was incredibly also nice to present these characters with a different graphic language but also having to convey that they are still the same characters and to realize which are the details in which you um, build the personality of the characters it was a, a very unique experience for me because then i realized okay i can draw like these kids in 10 different ways and always make them be themselves. And that uh, gave me a lot of freedom and confidence in what I could do in the rest of the story. And the other one mm -hmm. I had to mention is Open the Moon, because I think it's uh, that short story is like one of the, probably the most beautiful thing that I have crafted with a, a, a col another creative collaborator, in this case, Joe Hill and Jay Photos, which are... Uh, I, I, I want to take the moment to mention how important it is to, to be committed in a project like this with the right people in the right moment. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that made uh, Lock and Key the unique thing it is, is the fact that we created not only an amazing book, but also an amazing relationship as friends with Joe, Jay, and Chris, and everyone involved in the development of, of Lock and Key. Uh, I had the chance to build uh, friendships that have endured throughout time and have guys like Chris or Joe, which uh, already I feel like my brothers at this point, and, and having the chance to share that sort of bond throughout the creating of the book certainly makes the entire experience something special. Yeah. Um, I, I have a quick question, mu much less heavy question, but a, a quick question about uh, the double page spread that we were talking about from the play. Mm -hmm. and this is jumping ahead a little bit and talking about Clockworks, which we're going to yeah. discuss probably on the next podcast. Yes. But uh, Kinsey and Tyler show up there sort of in their ghost time traveling forms, mm -hmm. but it's the same picture from back two volumes prior yeah. did you plan the space for them or did that just kind of work out naturally that sort of worked out naturally <laughs> that's a but crazy specific question yeah uh, i mean yeah. Man, when i was reading it i was like holy shit <laughs> was there space for them originally because in a worked. way i throughout lock they were and key, always there. i learned that i had to <laughs> save like safe spots here and there uh, because i we knew at a certain point that we were going to deal with the uh, time traveling and I think when we were working on head games, we already had sorted down. So I'm not exactly sure if Joe mentioned that we were 
going to be returning to that scene. But, uh, well, th that's the other thing in which my architectural background helps me a lot. It's that I, it helps me to play with space, with the way in which you represent space uh, in a scene, in a particular scene. And, and that's why I think, uh, for example, the, the shots in which we fix the camera in certain shot and then we repeat panels, changing little things here and there, uh, help, help us a lot in a way to develop the storytelling technique of, of uh, lock and key. So the thing is that I uh, used to save uh, safe space in, in lots of panels uh, by two things. One is because I knew that at some point there was going to be time traveling and you have to save like safe spot for that. And also because uh, lock and key is a very wordy uh, comic. So you <laughs> really need to give a lot of air around the characters so then the lettering can fit uh, the, the, the dialogues and everything and, and be all an integral part of the, of the image. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think, uh, after probably in, in issue four and so on. Uh, no, I think for, from volume three on, we always started discussing with Joe what we were going to do in each volume and what are the things that we're going to develop in the upcoming volumes. So we sort of start like planning scenes and, and, and certain like cliffhangers and stuff like that, uh, very aware of what's going to come next in a couple of volumes after. And that helped us a lot in a way that the way in which IDW allowed us to develop the series in which we do, we did like volumes as if they were TV seasons and then have a little break bef before jumping in the next one allowed us to have a time for a week or so in which we discussed ideas with Chris and Joe about how, uh, what we wanted to do with the next volume as a unit, what was the part that it was going to play in the overarching story, and what are the things that we're going to save for later. So that helped a lot to give uh, Lock and Key a lot of uh, a very heavy consistency throughout it. And having that consistency granted, it gives you much more room to play with the form and stretch things and do weird things because you know that the compass is not missing. You know where you're heading, so you can take the turns in the in the journey until you get to the safe safe points to continue the story in a way that makes sense. Uh, bouncing off that a little bit, the Fox pilot was filming while you guys were working on the series itself. Yes. The other ones yes. happened may much later. Hulu yeah. happened much later. Obviously, Netflix happened much yeah. later. Um, but being on set for that, seeing it live, seeing the people live, even if they look different. I mean, Jesse McCartney, for example, <laughs> doesn't exactly look like Tyler Locke in the book. But did any of that affect how you approach the end of the series? I think it didn't, because at that point, we had already discussed where we were heading with the story. Uh, I remember when we started working in head games, uh, Joe and Chris asked me that if the uh, story kept developing as an ongoing series, if I was interested in, in keep drawing the story. And I told them that I was absolutely in for it as long as we were heading for an ending that made sense. I, I, I mm. love long stories as long as they drive you to a point that makes sense and mm. have a fulfilling closure. Because uh, uh, I, I don't like comics that, because of their success, get overstretched. Uh, overstretched and yet then you figure yeah. out when is the point when they start like dragging things and expanding, expanding things that were not that interesting. Uh, and I didn't want that to happen to Lock and Key. And then immediately Joe told me that it, it, we were going to point to an ending and sort of what the basics idea for that were going to be. So uh, for the ending itself, I, I'd say it didn't affect us that much. What it, I think in a way what uh, watching the, the Fox pilot be shot uh, gave us was a notion of how big this universe could be and, and what kind mm -hmm. of things it could inspire in other people. Um, I was afraid at that point that if the show happened back then and we were going to have the show running at the same time as we were doing the story, that would create some sort of noise that could be creatively destructive. Uh, I think in a way it was, in the long run, it was best for us 
that it didn't mm. happen at that time and that we had absolute freedom to finish the book in the way we wanted to. Uh, and I think, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's always better also for the people that's going to be doing an adaptation of it to be working with something that's complete. I think that gave them also a lot of freedom because they know the entire field in which they're playing right. and they know where they can take the story. And also they, they know which is the potential of the actual story, knowing where it ends. So uh, I think in a way the, the big... Uh, the big thing that people keep discussing about Lost is the ending. And, and <laughs> when you saw the series, you realize, okay, these guys certainly have a very clear idea of how they wanted to start the story, but probably not so much of how they wanted yeah. to end it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and we were very... And something of sort of the same happen, happened with the X-Files. And both mm. uh, Joe and myself were huge fans of the X-Files. And for us, the X-Files exist from season one until season four and a half. And everything oh, yeah. else is just merchandise. Wow. It's like the Star Wars wow. movie. There's only three of them. They are all the other the rest is merchandise. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, wow. and I think it was... <laughs> I Sorry, when was... you're saying only three Star Wars movies, you mean Attack of the Clones, mm -hmm. hey. uh, Phantom Menace, and Revenge of the Sith, and that's it, wow. right? In that exactly. order. Uh, in that order. It, Hot it's from, my machete order. It's from the midi chlorian scene on. From that yes. point on. Everyone's <laughs> favorite concept. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a quick question about the Netflix series itself. Now, looking forward, um, what actors do you have in line to play um, our characters? Uh, you, of course. Great question, Justin. Great the, question. The, the, well, because you know, with make... the de the de aging uh, process they used in the Irishman, yeah. I feel like I could pass as a high school student <laughs> still. Absolutely, absolutely. Movie magic at, at its best. I think if it's not you, I would ask for the cancellation of the show. So, my man, that's it what I'm had to be about. the I'm original a long gunman actor. of Lock and Key showing up for the Lock and Key long gunman scenes. So, th there's no yeah. discussion of that. It, Daniel, it was I love it. Alex, you're lucky. You're lucky, Alex, you're aging into the character. <laughs> like... I've been actually walking randomly up to people on the street and diagnosing their spines. It's good. Uh, just to prep for the role, just to get you, to You always Smart. have to consider that in Lock and Key, there's a key that we haven't shown yet, but we have shown its effect precisely in the scene of the play in which we see old Randall Locke portraying Prosperous in the, no. in the play itself. That's yes. not makeup. That's the action of one of the keys. So we mm -hmm. can have you all in the whichever age you want to be in the show. So uh, that's no problem at all. The, I'll the keep important, my calendar free. As, as in the comic, the important thing is the core of the character. And that's the thing <laughs> that we need to, to bring into proper place into the adaptation. I, 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 I'm sure of it. That's perfect because I haven't changed since high school. So it's good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was counting on it. That's why your character mm -hmm. was built in the way it was. And Thank you know you, that. Sir. Thank you for now seeing once, my inner soul. Once we do get past these important character introductions of Dr. Zalbin and whatever the other character's name, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the other thing that's going on, to get back to what we were just talking about, is this is going to be the first time that Lock and Key, the TV series, is going on and you're actively working on Lock and Key because you and Joe mm -hmm. are tackling it again. You're going to be uh, releasing World War Key, I believe, towards the end of the year is the goal right now? We have a, a, a couple optimistic uh, schedule goals that are still <laughs> on foot. I'm hoping they were going to work. But the thing is, despite exactly when it happens, uh, the thing is that it's going to happen. We have, a, we have first to close, uh, uh, complete a couple short stories to complete the Golden Age arc. That's going mm. to be collected in the seventh unnumbered volume of Lock and Key. That's going to come up uh, sooner than World War Key. And one of the reasons of that is because some events in World War Key are related with a couple details of episodes mm. of that uh, arc as well. So we want to wrap that first. And also uh, doing these uh, one-shots has been a great way to return to this universe and like train the hand to be properly like geared up and fueled to, to get into the longer form uh, in a better shape. Uh, but yeah, we are already working in this uh, uh, short stories that are going to complete the Golden Age. The, the very 
ending of that arc is going to be a very, very special episode. So I'm hoping that you guys will be paying attention throughout the next month because IDW is going to be in, to make an announcement about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I encourage you to stay tuned to that. Uh, and yes, we, we Joe, we're already like trading emails to start like fitting schedules in order to get into the into the pre-production of uh, World War Key because uh, we already have a concept that we want to develop and the way in which we want to deal with that uh, through the story because we want to expand the, the we want to explore the expanded universe of the of the lock and key world. We already sort of hinted that when we did the the guide to the known keys in each of the books and through the golden age and some bits here and there. But now we want to dive into that expanded universe and do sort of episodes that reflects the past of Lock family happening things in parallel with the present of the Lock kids that we know and love already. So it's going to be incredibly fun. I think we, we have the right story to tell. One of the reasons we wait to return to the Lock and Key universe is that we wanted to have the right story to tell. We didn't want just to milk the cow uh, and try to <laughs> squeeze these characters in a way that they were not ready to. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's going to be really fun to return to, to this uh, to this universe. And we're very eager to do that. And and I, for the first time, feel like I'm fully like equipped to tell whichever story we need to tell with, with this character. So I'm more excited than ever wow. because I, I don't have this... Uh, reluctances that I had uh, when I started drawing the first uh, lock and key arc. In a way, I think I already drawn over almost 3,000 pages of comics at this point. Ooh. So yeah. I think with that training, I should be, whatever I won't be able to do is something I will never be able to do. So at this point, I just have to <laughs> surrender to my limitations and try, just try my best. <laughs> That's going to be fun. It's going to be really fun. Yeah. So and, uh, and the World War Key arc, is that still, I mean, obviously it's very early days, but is it still going to, beyond delving through the history of Key House, focusing on the Revolutionary War and the Civil War and all these different wars that are happening around it, are we still going to have that emotional core, that center of the Locke family of Kinsey, Tyler, Bodie, Nina? Absolutely. The thing, uh, the thing that we sort of figure out is a way in which to play with both both poles of the lock and key universe. And I think that's going to be like the really fun part of it because we're going to keep our, our grounded base in the, in the locks that we know and love. We're going to explore them in a different stage of their life as well. Uh, mm -hmm. the, in, a, in a way we hinted some of that in the short story, nailed it that we released in which we saw the, the return of key house that's going to be, despite, uh, I think some people got it as a sort of a joke, but it's not, because in a way, that's a very important moment for Tyler as a character that's going to have some consequences in the future. And Ooh. also in that same short story, even though for a very brief time we get to see Kinsey and, and Bodhi both in a different stage of their lives already, Bodhi is a little a bit taller, a bit slimmer. Kinsey felt more confident, like a more grown woman. So it's going to be really fun to, to get back to these characters and see how they have developed after the events of the first arc. In a way, what we saw in the development of Tyler for the first arc is going to continue on in the development of the, all the rest of the characters in the, in the upcoming volume. So, yeah, it's going to be really fun to, to play with both poles and also to, to explore some most of that humanity that's very like uh, one of the core elements of Lock and Key that we saw in these characters and in a way that we hinted that we can explore that kind of very human elements in other characters as we did in stories like Open the Moon and short stories like that in which we realized that uh, uh, with all the weirdness and, and heavy like uh, events that affected their lives, uh, how they personally deal with that is what makes the Locks a very a very special family so we want to dig into that like head first and in the intervening time other than the golden age books you've done a lot of amazing projects you've done little nemo in slumberland you did sort yeah. of ages you've done a yeah. bunch of other things was there yeah. 
any reticence on your part then to jump back and say, great, next six years, lock and key, that's it for me? Uh, no, I, I think, well, when I finished the first, like, uh, the first, the first six volumes, I was like really exhausted. Uh, so <laughs> it was like, we need a, a bit of distance for this. Uh, and also because it was like very intense, uh, to work in, in Alpha and Omega was incredibly exhausted. I think Joe always find a way to write like the most impossible to draft scenes <laughs> ever. It's yeah. like yeah. every new issue scripts came with more and more apologies in the descriptions. At least he <laughs> was like aware of that. Uh, and it was like very challenging. Luckily, I got, a, I got permission from the editorial team that told me, take as much time as you need to draw this uh, because we just want to stick the landing as good as, as we get. And I also appreciate that the patience that the readers had because the, the publishing timing of the last issue of, of Lock and Key was a nightmare. But believe me, there was no way to do it sooner. Uh, and yeah, when, when we finished it, it was like very exhausted. It was like very like emotionally draining. It was like a, just everything that happened to Kinsey and Nina and Bodie and Tyler and their friends yeah. and the deaths that happened throughout the story. And, and also the, the thing when you, when you get to work in scenes that you've been planning for four or five years back, it's it's really weird. It's like when you finish, yeah. it's like I need to stop for a while just like to give like a proper distance to the entire experience that this has been and to digest this in a way that, that you can like project it in the future in a more like mature way after that. Uh, so I, I'm very thankful that we took this space to wait a bit. Uh, both of us, Joe and myself, wanted to try other things in between. Joe had lots of commitments with his own work as a prose writer that he had to, to complete a lot of projects and stuff like that. And I think everything that we did in between helped us to be like better than ever to return to the, to the world of lock and key. So I think uh, I, I appreciate a lot that the chance that the publisher gave us to stay away from this world for a while that we gave ourselves and also that the patience and the care that we get from the readers because lots of people immediately asked for more lock and key stories and stuff like that but i think almost everyone understood that we wanted to return to this to do th something that would be meaningful not only to us as creators uh, to have a purpose of what we wanted to do with the story but also that's something that would be uh, that would meet the expectations of the readers of Lock and Key because one thing is to start a story like this with nothing as background so people would be only surprised with co what comes up next but now we know that there's a, there's a certain expectation that you have to deal with in the development of the future of the story we are very aware that we don't want to do fan service at all but we mm. have to be respectful of what this story means to a lot of people. So we want to to be aware of that is, is something that will help us to, to develop the story in a proper way, I think, in the stories that are here to come. And, and one of the things that excites me is that I think that we were going to capture a lot of the things that make Locke special, but we're going to do something completely different that we did in the first six books. So I don't feel that we will be repeating ourselves. I don't think that we will be like uh, exploring the same things over and over. One of, the, one of the reasons that we did the February in volume four of, of Lock and Key was that we, we didn't want Lock and Key to become a procedural series. So we yeah, sort of mm -hmm. like burn out a lot of stuff that could have been like an entire volume into a single issue because we knew that, okay, this is all the stuff that could happen in this universe. If we take this event and develop it one by one, it could feel like an iteration of the same idea. And that's something that, for example, makes a lot more sense to explore in the format of a TV show. And that's one of the reasons that I'm very excited for the adaptation of Lock and Key, that they will have the room to explore this kind of stuff in a way that doesn't feel like that. And in a format, and in a storytelling format in which it makes sense 
but in comic book form or, or as a graphic novel, it had to have a different logic. So we went for that one. Yeah. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, that was the plan with the Fox show that they would do Welcome to Lovecraft in the first episode, mm -hmm. then do Key of the Week for a while, and then keep coming back to the story here and yeah, there. Yeah, it, it was a sort of a way to, to, to present it, and, and I think that's how Josh Friedman pitched it to, to Fox in a way that they would get what the show could be. So, so yeah, I think uh, one of the, the funniest thing that a, a project like this has is having such vivid characters and having such a strong mythology, the form can be bent in different ways. And yeah. you can, the, the important thing is that you know where your roots are set, but from then on, the branches can extend like anywhere. And I think that's one of the things that make uh, Lock and Key such a fun, such a fun world to dive in and to have the chance to get back to it on ourselves and at the same time that other people will, is going to be playing with it different ways. It's, it's great. And, in, and I think uh, for what I've seen so far, I've seen just part of the, of the Netflix show, not, not the entire thing, just uh, a few advances. But uh, I think uh, one of the liberating experience for me was to realize that the show is close enough to the source material to, to get you bonded with it, but different enough in which you feel that if you keep developing the comic, you're not going to be stepping on the foots of the TV show or vice versa. Yeah. And that's something that makes you feel like much more comfortable in, in, in the prospect of trying to do your own thing from here on. It's interesting that TV has changed so much since you were first developing it back in mm -hmm. the Fox pilot days. Absolutely. Because now Netflix is sort of like a trade. Like the season all drops at once. It's something where you can just yeah. – it can be as long or as short. It doesn't have to be a procedural where you do key of yeah. the week. It can be closer yeah. to the source material while also still making those creative leaps that you talked about that are so exciting. And uh, yeah, great timing. Yeah, yeah. I think in a way, everything that has happened in the development of this uh, property has helped uh, for it to be its best possible self. And I think that's a blessing for us as creators and has been great for our audience and our readership. So I'm really hoping that everything that's still going to come from the Logan Key universe is going to be something gratifying and fulfilling and entertaining and and something that will also like give people things to discuss and share and talk and think about i i think in a way one of the things that i that really uh keeps me enthusiastic about making more comics and making more stories is that i think that it still capture a moment of uh, silence and introspection in a civilization that has turned like very noisy and filled mm. with overcrowded information in which we sort of shout to each other all the time through different platforms. And I think uh, the experience of reading and sharing stories that you care about and discussing about the things that story means to you gives you still a, a, a place in which you can safely stop for a while and get away from the noise and be a bit more reflective and and enjoy things in a quieter and more uh, peaceful way and and to figure out that through stories you can relate to people that's so much different from you because it relates you to other readers but also through the story relates you to a lot of experience that sometimes you haven't experienced but lets you understand other people that have so I think uh, we're in a time in which uh, smart and thoughtful and meaningful and heartfelt storytelling is pretty necessary. And I think in a way it's a window to remind us that we need to relate and empathize to each other in a more like thoughtful and caring way. I think yeah. that is a beautiful note to start wrapping up here on. Uh, for yeah. all of you listening out there, definitely pick up Lock and Key. It's absolutely fantastic. You have uh, plenty of time to read through it before the Netflix show. Also, definitely pick up Gary Orjiga's Little Nemo and Slumberland, Sort of Ages. They're both fantastic. Is there anything else you want to plug that people should be checking out? 
Uh, no, I think you already covered our corners. I say uh, stay tuned to announcements this year. I'm right now working in things that I can't mention, but I'm hoping that we're going to be excited to people that has been following uh, my work. I want to, to take a minute to thank to thank everyone that has read our books and that are follows our work and that basically allow us to do what we love for a living uh, is such a weird, unique experience for me to be able to live and, and sustain a family project devoted to an activity that was completely uh, unexpected and strange when I started working on, coming from a country in which a formal industry uh, like comic book doesn't exist. And not only that, but also to, to have, through this work, to have the chance to meet amazing people, uh, to meet my own characters in the flesh. It's uh, <laughs> so, so <laughs> unique. Uh, but basically, yeah, I, I would like to thank everyone because all these amazing, thing, all these amazing things, things that are happening to Lock and Key are happening because there's lots of people that cared about the story and supported it and allow us to keep uh, dreaming about doing more stories. So... Thanks, everyone, and thanks to be around. And thank you guys for inviting me to chat with you. It's amazing to, to have the chance yeah. to stop for a while and see these uh, amazing, friendly faces that I, ah. I have been <laughs> following us since the very beginning of, of this weird adventure that Lock and Key has been. But I want to say thanks to you because, you know, as comic book readers, you know, we get a lot of stuff and having something that is so powerful, uh, so beautiful, also so scary, but so family-oriented. Uh, it's awesome to be able to hold up a book like that and be like, this is amazing. People yeah. should check this out. This is so powerful. This is going to move you. But also... <laughs> it's that be so excited he's punching his microphone right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. But that's how I express excitement. Uh, but then to also be able to meet the people behind it and have them be just as amazing as the projects ha has been really a, a fantastic roller coaster for us. So thank you f for not only creating something that was so powerful and touching, but also, uh, you know, uh, being so nice to us throughout the years and putting us in such amazing work. So thank you. Yeah. And uh, well, just on, on top of that. On top of that, uh, truly to be rereading it now and still be affected by it, like I was crying reading the end again, and it's just like, it's, it's crazy, a story I know, uh, to then be still so emotionally surprised and invested in it. And also to read it at a, time, a totally different time in my life where, like, when I read this, I was a kid originally, yeah. and now I have kids. It's yeah. weird, uh, yeah. uh, for yeah. sure. And have it, you, it takes on different meanings, and it's just, it's a great work, and it's great that uh, you made it and that you're making more. So it's exciting to be here. Cool, yes. And you. for me, I started as a doctor when we were reading it, and I'm still a doctor, so it's pretty much the same. Yeah, Alex is my doctor because of this comic, and I am By the way, you, you got to get that thing checked out, Justin. Yeah, tell me what it is. Don't say that thing. Give me no, more specifics. I'll tell you. Uh, Gabriel, thank you so, so much for being here. This has been an absolute pleasure. A uh, couple of quick things for us to plug here at the end. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater Loft in New York. Come on by. We will definitely chat with you about Lock and Key. Socially, you can follow this podcast on Lock and Key Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can subscribe and comment. Please do comment. Those help us a lot on iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and more. And remember, keep your Netflix subscriptions at least through February 8th because we've got to <laughs> see that first season of Lock and Key. Have a good night, everybody.